You ever felt like everything you've ever tried to do is live up to people's expectations? You have all these labels that people have thrown on you. Like stupid, outcast, weird. G-A-Y. All these labels have tried to define you for so long and you just don't know what to do with them. It's almost like the thoughts that you've been having are almost your own, even though it the voice isn't familiar. Like, have you ever just been in a place where people are telling you who you should be and what they think would fit you best, but you just feel like you don't fit that mold. Well, I wanna to talk to you today about your identity. I think our identity is one of the most powerful things that the Lord has given us. Our identity can be found in so many different things. It can be found in what we do. It can be found in our relationships. Right? Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. It's like our identity can be wrapped up in so many different things. And I think that's why the Lord actually changes our identity when we come to him. <laughs> because we're found in all these other areas and facets of life where we're told what to think. We're told who to be. We're told what to become. And yet this is why Jesus says, you must be born again. Now, I know that has little to do with identity and mostly to do with salvation. But I feel like this video specifically is for people just like you and me who have struggled with their identity for a long time. You know, I grew up in a broken home. Uh, my parents divorced when I was two years old. And it left me with a lot of questions. It left me with a lot of what ifs. And um, a lot of the actions of family affected me mentally, emotionally. And I questioned a lot of if it was my fault, if maybe if I could have done something to help it. Um, it left me with questions of, you know, Am I loved? <laughs> am I cared for? Um, who am I? What am I supposed to do with my story now? And, you know, I went through years and years of, of counseling to heal the pieces of my heart that I didn't understand. And through that process, it led me to a place of full surrender to King Jesus and I, I didn't quite get why I struggled so long with my identity because it was almost as if like that was the main piece of who I was. If I don't find out who I am, then I'm never going to be okay. Am I just, you know, a son of uh, separated parents? Am I uh, a brother? Am I you know, weird? Am I fat? Am I ugly? Am I all these things that I was told? Am I a victim because I was bullied for seven years of my life in uh, elementary and junior high and high school? You know, what label really fits me? Um, because am, am I just a mesh of all those labels? Am I just a byproduct of my story? Or is there something outside of myself that actually defines me? Because for so long, I tried to find my identity in the things that were internal. I tried to define my identity on things that happened to me and through me. Um, you know, I, it led me down a path of, you know, being reckless and living sexually immoral and lying and stealing <laughs> and cheating people out. Um, treating people so harmfully with my words and attacking people that I loved the most. 
because I did not know how to deal with unresolved identity issues. And so my heart behind this chat is just that hopefully you would feel and know that your identity needs to be secure in something. Your identity needs to be secure in someone. And I mean, immediately when I was praying about this video, 1 John chapter 3 came to mind and it says, See what kind of love the Father has given up to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But what we know, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called, what? Children of God. And so we are. And the world doesn't know us. That's the thing is my coworkers don't know Jesus, a lot of them. My family, some of them don't know Jesus. And my friends, a lot of them don't know Jesus. And so they're trying to find their identity, their purpose, out of things in this world that can offer them temporary satisfaction, temporary happiness. You know, I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday, actually, and he said something to me that struck my heart. And he said, you know, I feel like I've always known the truth. I've always understood this whole Jesus thing. I've I've kind of got my bearings, right? But I've always tried, lived my life in a way to suppress it so that way I can live based on what's convenient for me. And that leads to a lot of confusion, right? The Bible talks about God being a God of peace, not of confusion. The enemy brings confusion. The enemy is going to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is his goal. That is his mission. So if he can take your identity, if he can take your purpose, and he can cause you to question everything that God has said over you, you won't do anything for the kingdom. And I feel as, as I'm sharing even just now, like you're sitting behind the screen thinking like, why did I even click this video? <laughs> why am I even sitting here watching this video? This guy that I maybe don't know. Uh, my name is Joe, by the way. Maybe I don't know. Talk about identity. And I've been searching. I've been searching for the real. And I find that I look around at culture, at the world, that you turn on the news. I mean, come on. People are shouting to be recognized. People are longing for attention to be given. You flip on social media and it's all about me. It's all about what I have to offer. And I'm not saying inherently it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that culture is saying it's all about you. And I'm here to tell you today that it's not all about you. There's something bigger. There's something more grand. Something beyond your imagination that actually gives you a purpose. That gives you an identity. And the thing about it is, like, I've been on this journey of discovering and rediscovering my identity for years now. I mean, I became a Christian when I was 16 years old. So for 11 years, I've been discovering over and over and over again what it means to be a child of God. What does that even look like? Does that mean that I just, you know, slap a Christian sticker on my chest? On my shirt, I wear a Christian logo. I wear Christian clothing. Like, do I just wear the brand? Do I just wear the jersey? Do I just put on the t-shirt and I'm good? Like, I'm on the team? What does it mean? What does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to be adopted as sons and daughters? What does that even look like? Because for so long, 
all I knew was that I was an angry, insecure, selfish person. That's all I cared about was me. And now God's saying I'm a child of God, which means inherently that now I have a family. Like that, that word is, that word is so hard to grasp. Family. For me, it's blended. Like, you know, for my wife, it's, it's one mom, one dad, siblings, grandma, grandpa. And for me, it's, it's multiple people involved. And I'm like, how do I navigate this? How do I navigate being a son and a stepson? How do I navigate being a brother and an only child? <laughs> for my mom, an only child. For my dad, a sibling. How do I navigate this? How do I understand my story? How do I, how do I put these pieces together? You know, and a lot of this journey, a lot of this process has been me, honestly, me grieving grieving a lot I think we see a lot of times on social media even here on YouTube and all over the internet people just showing their best version of themselves my hope is that by me having this conversation with you is that you would see the hardest part of myself this has been the hardest and most difficult thing for me to address is my identity. Because I just went through three years of questioning who I am, what I'm called to do, and if it even matters. And I thought that once I became a Christian, it's almost like, a fix-all for everything. And that's not the case. When you become a Christian, when you believe in Jesus, when you follow the way, it doesn't mean that Jesus is going to just fix all your problems. What it does mean is that all your problems are now going to be with the one who can fix them. He'll be with you every step of the way. He'll address them with you. He'll walk them through through with you. And at first I was angry. <laughs> like, God, why don't you just take this from me? Like, why don't you just take the fact that I have this hole in my heart from not getting the attention I desired when I was a child? Like, why, why don't you fill this hole in my heart for wanting a, you know, relationship like I see with other other people? with their dads, with their moms. Like, why can't I have that? And slowly but surely, the Lord would talk to me about what he has to bring to the table. Now he can be my dad. How Jesus is the way, truth, and the life. And no one, no one comes to the Father except through him. Like, I have restored relationship with the Father again. But does he even want to spend time with me? Does, does he even care about my decisions? Is he going to show up for me when I need him most? These are questions that I just, I didn't know how to address. I didn't know how to talk about. And through going to counseling, going to therapy, I mean, whatever you want to call it, spiritual direction. I learned to address these things with the Holy Spirit and to ask God to help me believe that I'm a child of God. Help me to believe that I'm loved by Him, that I was chosen before the foundation of the world, predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that I'm called to something. I'm not just called from something. That I'm actually brought into a family out of the kingdom of darkness, conveyed into the kingdom of light. And I was studying this week, thinking about that word conveyed, and it has the image in, in Jewish culture where 
a king would actually come or an emperor and he would conquer the opposing city. And the citizens of that city would now become residents of that kingdom and they would now belong to that king. And so Jesus has done all the heavy lifting, right? Like he's conquered the enemy. He's defeated death, hell, and the grave. He's gotten the keys to the kingdom. He has all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, you go, right? He's given us authority to go and make disciples, to do all the things he's called us to do. But being a child of God, if you don't know what it means to be a child of God in the natural then it's going to be very, very difficult for you to understand what it means to be a child of God in the spiritual. At least your lens is going to be skewed. I'm speaking from experience. Your lens will be skewed. You'll see God through a faulty lens. You'll see God through a broken lens. And you'll only see him through your brokenness until you address the fact that your brokenness is what's causing you to see him wrong. My brokenness was my lens because I I expected God to act in the way that I had experienced people in my past. I expected God to act in a way where he was disinterested in what I cared about. I expected God to act in a way that I've been wounded in the past. And, you know, these last three years, I've, I thought I was secure. I thought I was solid in Him. And then when, right before we moved to Idaho, Something happened, and I was verbally insulted, attacked, told that I was gifted, but it was going to go to waste, that God wants me to use me for the kingdom, but I'm in bondage and spreading it around to people. And that what I had to offer was never going to make a difference. I didn't really know how to talk about it. I didn't really know how to how to go anybody go to anybody about it. Because that person was a trusted authority figure in my life. And they just completely made me question everything about myself. And these last four months of being in Idaho have been some of the most, one of the most healing seasons in my life. Because I've allowed God to free and reshape my heart. And rebuild me from the inside out. It's like I'm adopted, right? We're adopted as children of God. But when somebody comes after you that's also a children of, child of God and they do all of these things in his name and they really hurt you, what are you going to do with it? Because I just shoved it down. Didn't want to address it. 
I didn't want to talk about it because it was so painful. I felt like every time I shared it, it just rewounded me. But I feel like the Lord is cauterizing my wounds. That's the best way to describe it. The Lord is cauterizing my wounds with his eternal fire of love. And I'm so grateful for it. I think sometimes... We want to hide from the things that have hurt us most. And it only ends up affecting our relationship with Him. It only makes us see Him through that broken lens. And if it's true that I'm a child of God, if it's true that I'm adopted, if it's true that I'm loved and redeemed and forgiven and chosen by Him, The only explanation that I can come to is that I let other things define me. I let everything else define who I was. You know, oh, you're a poet. You're a a preacher, a pastor. You're, You're a counselor at heart. You're all these things. And I held on to those things because they're good things. But who am I really? What am I called? Who am I called to be? At the core of all of this, it's a child of God. (laughs) We're all called to be children of God once we become believers. If you're not a believer and you're watching this video, I pray that the Lord brings you home. He brings you home. Because real Christianity is, it's hard. It's not easy. And to pretend like it's always roses and lilies and everything is perfect is a scam. And I don't want you to ever think that Christianity is a scam. And that we're just in it because we want a blessed life. And we want to prosper and be wealthy and all this crap. It's not true. To be a Christian is to be somebody who loves Jesus, is a child of God, and wants to live for his kingdom because of what he's done for them. In its simplest form, is to be a person of the way. Somebody who's seen the sacrifice of Christ and chooses every day to deny himself or herself to take up their cross and to follow him. That's what it means to be a Christian. So kind of my journey right now is just going to save people that I trust, that have loved me in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my confusion and questioning and if I can ever trust a a pastor again, a leader again, a church person and authority again. Because it got, I mean, really bad. Even just being here a couple months, it's like, I would find myself almost going like this. I did go like this. In times of worship at church and You know, it wasn't until my wife, she asked me, she goes, "Uh, why are you doing that? I'm like, well, I'm just, you know, enjoying worship. I'm just putting my hand over my body. And she goes, no, I think you're, I think you're self-soothing. And I think there's a lot that's going on in your heart and your mind and your body is responding to it. And it's true. I had some unforgiveness in my heart. 
I thought I forgave. I thought I moved on. But sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes you don't even know that's what you need. Sometimes you don't even know that that's in there until somebody points it out. <laughs> and our identity is, it's the piece of us that God wants the most. <clears throat> God wants our identity secure. He wants our foundation firm. He wants us to be rooted and grounded in love. That's his heart for us. That's his desire. That's his goal. For us to be loved and to be like him. That's the goal of all of this. <coughs> Is to love Jesus and to make him known. And my prayer and my hope for you <clears throat> is that you would know that 99% of the time it's, <clears throat> it's not an instant. It's not an instant transformation. People say, Jesus changed me in one moment, right? I hear that all the time. Jesus changed my life in one moment of worship or one moment of a sermon. Jesus did this for me. <coughs> but really, we don't talk about the times that Paul got met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Damascus. And then he spent three years in the deserts of Arabia spending that with Jesus. And then doing everything he did. <clears throat> I wonder why we give this picture to people. Like, everything's just going to be better. <laughs> everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to just work out the way you want it to. <clears throat> That's not my experience. <clears throat> my experience is going through the crucible, going through really difficult times. I prayed for God to make me strong, and He gave me experiences with my weakness to show me that I need Him. I prayed for him to help me understand what it means to be a child of God. And he gave me people that pushed me closer to him so that he was my only source of fatherhood or motherhood. He's the only one I can rely on. I mean, everybody fails you, right? At some point. People aren't perfect. They make mistakes. Even after becoming a Christian, <laughs> they fail and make mistakes and mess up. But the beautiful part about it is, is <clears throat> when you're an adopted child of God, he's still enough. <clears throat> God is enough for you. When you're an adopted child of God, God is enough for you. <clears throat> and we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. <clears throat> we love because he first loved us. Our identity comes from him. As adopted sons and daughters of God, we love because he first loved us. 
I don't love because I want to get love. It's selfish. It's all about me. And personally, I think that part of my journey was loving to get recognition. <clears throat> loving to get praise. <laughs> Doing in order to get. And that's on me. Because I wanted to become this person that everybody loved. And that's pleasing man. The fear of man. <clears throat> the fear of man is a, is a trap. It's a snare. But those who fear the Lord will be safe. And I think it's important for us as believers to understand that loving Jesus it's not a means to an end. I had a pastor tell me that this week and it made me realize where my heart was at. You know, oh, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm, or not fasting, I'm praying, I'm, I'm worshiping, I'm in the word, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm just not seeing what I think I should be seeing. And he said, you know, Jesus is not a means to an end. Hmm. What if he is the end? What if he is that means? What if he's both? He's the means and the end. <laughs> if we're not doing it for Jesus because we love him, we're doing it wrong. If we speak with angelic tongues and we don't have love, it's worthless. If we go to the stake to be burned as a martyr and we don't love, then it's pointless. If we, if we feed the poor and clothe the naked, but we don't love them, it's worthless. It makes no sense. Why are you even doing it? Because you want to be seen? Because you want to be recognized? Because you want the accolades? Well, I can tell you one thing. That is your reward. Your reward is people's praise. When your identity is set in other things, when your identity is placed in being seen by others, I can tell you from personal experience, that's your reward. Those, that applause is your reward. People saying, wow, that was great. You're such a nice guy. That is your reward. <clears throat> And I don't want my treasures stored in this on earth. I truly don't. Now that I understand where I'm coming from, like I just want to love. I want to meet the need of every moment that God places in my path. I want to love people. I don't want to do it because I want something from them. I don't want to do it because I need something from them. <laughs> I don't want to do it because I'm going to get recognized for it or an award or an applause or put on a platform or I'm going to be in the spotlight somewhere. I'm going to, you know, just use other people as a stepping stone to get what I want. Because Satan did that. He was the most beautiful creature in all of creation. And he wanted God's throne. And here's the thing about Jesus, is he will not share his glory with anyone else. He won't. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And he will not share his glory with another. There's only one space, one seat, and one throne that can only be occupied by one person. And it's Jesus. Your identity being found in all these other things, if he is not on the throne of your heart, if he is not the one that is on the throne, dictating and telling and ushering you into doing what it is that you're called to do, if he is not on the throne of your heart, then you are. <laughs> and he won't share his throne with another. You can have him as savior. Absolutely. 
You can have Jesus die on the cross for your sins and cover everything and you're saved and you're good to go. But not have him as Lord? Why? Because you you want it your own way. Hmm. Because you want to do what you want to do. Because sin is fun. Because, you know, you still want to sleep around and you still want to do drugs on the side and you still want to cheat people, lie, deceive. It won't be long before you forfeit your inheritance. I'll tell you that. God's a gentleman. He's not going to force you to do anything. God is not going to force you to do anything. This is a partnership. This is a co-laborship. We are called co-laborers with him. But if you want him, and you want a relationship with God, then it's what he says goes. Not what you say. Not what anybody else says. Even if you're misunderstood. Even if you lose relationships, even if your family disowns you, even if you're killed for your faith, Jesus is worthy of our lives. He's worthy of our love. And as children of God, as adopted sons and daughters, <clears throat> every spiritual gift and blessing is ours in him. He is rich in mercy. He is rich in love. He is rich in kindness. But he's also just. He's also holy. He's also righteous. And our identity in him will lead us in everything that we do. If our identity is in anything else but Jesus, if it's anything but in Christ, we're going to fail, 100%. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be burned. There's a way that seems right to a man and its end leads in death. That's your own way. That's your identity in anything other than him. In it of yourself, you have no ability to fly. <clears throat> as soon as you step on an airplane and you sit down in that seat and that pilot takes off, you can fly. When you step into Christ and you take on him and you are in him, you are able to do everything God has called you to do. But before that, you don't have a spirit. You're not his child. You're not redeemed. You're not saved. You're not forgiven. You're not empowered by this, the Holy Spirit that he gives as our helper. Our identity is the core of who we are. It's where everything else stems from. And God wants to redeem it. He wants to walk you through the really hard stuff that nobody else wants to talk to you about or that you don't even want to talk to with anyone else. He wants to address those hidden areas of your heart. He wants to go deep. And he wants to heal. You have to allow him to do the stitching, the cauterizing, the sealing. Because it's only going to get worse. If you allow it to continue, what's going to happen is, I'll tell you what's going to happen is, that wound is going to get infected. Infected wound, untreated, will eventually kill you. So if there's things in your heart, in your mind, in your life right now, that have gotten you to this place where you're in deep sadness, <clears throat> or you're anxious, or you just have low self-esteem, low self-worth, and you're just defeated, 
Allow the surgeon to go in and to heal your heart. I can tell you this, that he has a 100% success rate and he has steady hands. God's hands don't shake when he holds your heart. And he's really good at what he does. So my prayer for you today is this, that you would know him, that you would love him, and you would allow him to love you.